So, Revelation chapter 18, verses 9 to 20. So it says there, the threefold woe over Babylon's fall. So when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. Because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, and articles of every kind, made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. They will say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city! Dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, Precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads, and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Let us pray. Father, we ask that as we look at your word this morning, we pray, Father, that you would speak to us, that, Father, that you would and unveil yourself to us, that we would understand what you're trying to say through this passage, what you need us to hear this morning. Father, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, what a joyful passage to come back to church to. (laughs) It was funny because when I was putting together this service. Originally, I was wanting to do a, another particular passage that was full of joyfulness about coming together once again. But God had other ideas, and he drew me to, to this particular passage. And so this morning, hearing of the future of the world in the days to come, that's something we need to hear about, isn't it? But I find it amazing because aspects of this passage are being played out every day of the week right now. Now let me be clear, I'm not saying that these end time events are taking place right now. I'm not saying that what the Bible is describing that we're in the midst of that. But what is happening now gives us a small glimpse into uh, what's planning to come for humanity, for the events that are in store for for humanity in the days to come. You see, what these end times events and today's events have in common is this. The focus of humanity. During the destruction of Babylon, the great city which is at the heart of civilization, and I'll let you decide what that city is and who it is, but this great city is at the heart of civilization with its economic, political, social, and cultural power. It's being mourned. But it isn't mourned for the loss of all these things that the passage describes. No, it's mourned for what the people have lost. They're not saying that um, how sad it is that this city is disappearing. What they're saying is they're mourning for what they can no longer get from that city. Because their power, their prestige, and their money, all of that is being derived from all the horrible things that are happening in Babylon. They've lost, as I said, their power, their privilege, their purpose in life and their potential, all the things that could have come, has suddenly disappeared. 
their focus is on themselves. We tend to do that at times as well, don't we? Particularly at the passing of a loved one. How often, how often do people mourn what they're losing rather than the life itself? They're mourning the potential of the relationship that they could have had as opposed to mourning the relationship they did have. Or they're mourning the loss of what they can get from that person because they can no longer receive it from them. We see these things in our own time. People going out into the streets demanding their rights whilst putting the rights of others at risk. Well, there's a story in the QT um, just the other day on the front page. It looked a little bit like this yeah. if you go into the web page. But there's a particular story that jumps out. You might not be able to see it overly well. It says that police confront Somerset pair who refused to isolate. Now, that's just one story of many that we hear on the news, isn't it? We only have to look down to Victoria or if we want to see an even bigger example, look to America. But it happens all over the world. It's not just Americans. It's not just Australians. It's people. I have a right to not wear a mask rather than I love my neighbour enough to wear a mask. I have a right to travel wherever I want rather than I love my neighbour enough to keep them protected. Even Christians in some places declare that my right to go to church when our health experts say it isn't safe supersedes the rights of others to not have the virus spread through society. I want to go to church, so I'll go to church and I don't care if I make anybody else sick. That's the understanding of some. I will go to the shops because I want to buy whatever and I don't care if people get sick because of me. This is the attitude of people, isn't it? Some, many, whole countries. <laughs> but it, it is the attitude that has existed from the very start. I put myself over others. I put myself over God. It's what Adam and Eve did, isn't it? And it's the same attitude that comes all the way through. I am better or I am greater or I am more important or more deserving or whatever word you want to put there, but I comes before others. The focus is on self. So let me ask you, where is your focus? Where is your focus this morning? Well, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 1 reminds us of what life can be like for those whose focus is on God. It says in Psalm 1, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly. But the path of the wicked leads to destruction. See, the results of a life focused on oneself have always been the same. See, then sometimes we, we look around and think, well, but the people that are doing the wrong thing do prosper. They do get what they want. They have money, they have success, they have the, our property and all that stuff. So surely when this psalm was written, they, they got it wrong because sinners do prosper. And that's been a complaint of Christians right through the generations, hasn't it? Why isn't God dealing with them? Why isn't God dealing with the sinners? See, they may have success and riches in this life, but the eternal result is one of loss and destruction. But for those whom focus on Christ, they will taste eternal success and eternal riches and eternal life in God's presence. That's what we look forward to, isn't it? It doesn't matter about this world. This is all temporary. Yes, it's hard. 
but it's temporary. What is coming is eternal. What is coming is going to be um, far outweigh any of what we've gone through in this world. But sometimes we do think that it doesn't start until we die, don't we? That my reward comes when I die. My reward comes when I see Jesus face to face. But we forget that the word of God actually tells us that our reward starts the moment we come to Jesus. It starts the moment that Jesus forgives us of our sin. We start receiving our reward. It's there, moment by moment. See, when you're focused on Jesus, when your focus is on him, you are receiving your reward. It's a relationship with your saviour and your creator. That's reward in itself, isn't it? We don't need all the, the trappings of success. All we want is him. We want him to be number one in our life. He has to be first. He has to be in all and through all. So how do you focus your life on him then? Because it can be hard sometimes, can't it? When you're in the midst of problems or going to work when you really don't want to, it can be hard to focus on Jesus in that. Well, the first way is set aside time each day. Set aside time for him. Time is one of the most precious gifts that we have. As the quote says, it's something that you can never get back. We know that, don't we? Time only goes in one direction and it seems to get faster and faster the further along you go on that path. It becomes more and more precious each day. So we need to use it to focus on what is important. To take every moment to focus on what is important. It can be used spending time in the word, listening to worship music, praying, whatever it happens to be, as long as it's a, a regular time with him. It has to become a habit, doesn't it? Because things that aren't habits tend to disappear pretty quickly. That's one of the things COVID has shown us, isn't it? That we're so used to doing things a certain way that we actually need to, a clean break. We need something to happen to push us into a new habit. And that's, as Diane said before, we've been in this new habit now for five months that it's hard to come back to something different again. But we have to make it a regular time. Morning, noon, night, whenever it happens to be, it's got to be regular. Secondly, spend time with other believers. I'm sorry, Di. <laughs> but we are made for a relationship, aren't we? Even those of us that like spending time on our own. Jenny found me the other day spending some time on my own. I was in the bedroom listening to the rain falling outside that, that one day that we only got half the day of rain that we should have. I think I fell asleep three or four times in there. So I was just enjoying being by myself and listening to the rainfall. It's good to spend time on you, by yourself sometimes. We need that, particularly for those of us that are introverted. And that's part of who we are. If you're an extrovert, you hate being alone. You might like to be alone sometimes, but you actually gain your energy from being around other people. As Don said before, you go stir crazy when you don't have other people around you, at least from time to time. But for introverted people, we get our energy from spending time in our own minds, being alone with our own thoughts and feelings. But we are made for a relationship. We are made to be in relationship with one another. And that means spending time in one another's company. See, the Bible tells us in Matthew 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Now we have to, again, understand that passage correctly, don't we? Because we can have two or three people sitting in a room together uh, that are Christians and have no sign of God. You know why that is? Because to have that come to pass, our focus has to be on Jesus. We have to actually acknowledge that he's there. That means talking about him, what he has done or what he's doing in our life, 
what he's teaching you. See, in the coming months, we'll be introducing life groups where you'll be able to gather with other believers and walk the Christian life. I'll share more about that in the coming week's time. But the important thing is that we do life together. We hold each other accountable. We listen to each other's problems. We help each other when we need help. And we also understand that when people need time to themselves, that we allow them to have that time to themselves as well. Thirdly, find something that you're passionate about or enjoy do doing and use it to serve Jesus and others. If you like doing craft, find a craft group. If you enjoy woodworking, then join a men's shed. See Bill, he'll tell you where the good ones are. Or Don, I think you still go as well. There's some good, good groups of guys around where you can do these things together. If you enjoy gaming, play online games. Whatever, you, uh, whatever you're doing and wherever you're doing it, it's about the social aspect. And it's, for us as Christians, it's about bringing Jesus into it as well. Using the opportunities that we are given to talk about our faith, to talk about our love for him, and about what he is doing in our lives. Whatever it is, use the opportunities to build relationships with one another. And that may be only a one-line sentence at times. Sometimes we think that unless we can get in a full spiel about who Jesus is and what he has done for, for people and get the entire gospel out there in one go, then it's a waste of time. But sometimes it's about just that one sentence. See, when you use your gifts and talents given to you from Christ, you will focus more and more on him. It's not about using it for your own edification, for your own um, own needs, but using it in God's service as well. But whatever you do, and however you do it, take the opportunity to focus on him. That's the, one of the main lessons that I think COVID has taught us. That whatever's going on, our focus can still be on him. And if our focus is on him, then we won't be, go the way of this world. We won't go the way of Babylon and those within her walls. When our focus is on Jesus, we have no fear of what's going on around us because our eyes are only for him. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you that we don't have to be like those that um, will mourn and wail because they lose the things that they want. But that Father, that when our focus is on you, we will realise that the most important thing that we can have in this world, we already have. That's our relationship with you. So we pray, Father, that as um, the restrictions and things still go on uh, in the world around us, that, Father, that not only will you help us to focus on you, but you'll give us opportunities to help others to focus on you as well. To see beyond a virus and see beyond unemployment and all those other things that are happening. And that they can see the source and creator of this world, the one that will help us through it all. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.